monkeys go blah. I want to start this video off by saying I have 100% been caught in the trap of paying a lot of money to go and volunteer my time at a sanctuary that said it was doing really great amazing work only to arrive and within the first day to have a feeling that something was just not quite right. And this is a really, really common experience. It really shouldn't be. You would think that a sanctuary was immediately a place that's putting the welfare of animals first. That's literally why they exist. But unfortunately, with the rise of ecotourism, wildlife tourism, there's a growing body of organizations that just aren't quite what they say they are. So this video is here to help you try and find ethical sanctuaries and to make sure that when you're traveling, volunteering, gaining work experience, doing research studies, whatever it is you're doing, you can do it at a place that you truly believe in and that aligns with your moral values. Just before we begin, this video is focused on wildlife sanctuaries and not zoos. There is a pretty big difference between them. Um, if you're not familiar, then at its most basic level, zoos exist to have animals in captivity, whether that is for breeding programs, education, entertainment, whatever it happens to be. They run a little bit more like a business and they do tend to trade in animals. Sanctuaries, on the other hand, exist in order to take in animals in need, rehabilitate and care for them, and where possible release them back into the wild. The goal of a sanctuary is generally to have as few animals as possible in captivity at any one time, and to work with local communities to create environments and ecosystems where wildlife can thrive. So if you're looking at zoos, this is not the video for you, but if you want to find an ethical wildlife sanctuary, stick around and I will go through the main things that I do to vet any sanctuary before I visit or support it. So the very first thing that I do when I'm looking at wildlife sanctuaries is I start looking at accreditations. So for anyone who doesn't know, there are organizations in the world that basically will visit sanctuaries, assess them, look through their policies and all of their handling of animals and assess whether or not they think they are ethically run or run in lines with the criteria of that particular accreditation. Now, not all accrediting organizations are created equal. Some are very strict, have very, very clear criteria of what kind of ethics a sanctuary must follow in order to become accredited and are really thorough in their researching and their vetting of sanctuaries. Others are a bit more lenient and lax. So a sanctuary having accreditation doesn't instantly mean that it is ethical. You really have to go and check out that accreditation and see what their criteria are and what kind of things they may have missed that you might want to look into more but I'm gonna go through with you some of the main accreditations that I would look for when looking at sanctuaries. The first major one I wanna highlight is the Global Federation of Animal Sanctuaries, or GFAS. So GFAS is the only recognized worldwide accreditation and it covers sanctuaries, rescue centers, and rehabilitation centers. They have, in my opinion anyway, incredibly high standards for sanctuaries that they accredit, and they look not only into animal welfare, but also into the outreach and education that a sanctuary she partakes in and into the staff training and safety, which is a really important and often overlooked part of ethical sanctuaries. In order for a sanctuary to become GFAS accredited, they must be non-breeding, they must have no commercialization of animal body parts, there is no direct public contact with wildlife, and animals are not to be exhibited or taken from the sanctuary other than for medical reasons. Other accreditations that I tend to look out for are the American Sanctuary Association, the ASA, so obviously that is focused in America. It assesses organizations on a more case-by-case -case basis, so in my opinion is not as thorough as GFAS, but is a good starting point for you to then do further research into the sanctuary yourself. If you are looking around Europe, then there is the European Alliance of Rescue Centers and Sanctuaries, or EARS, which I think is adorable. The thing I really like about this accreditation, it's got a really thorough no breeding and contraceptive policy, which is really important in sanctuaries, and it also has a more general policy against tourist interaction with animals but it's definitely again not as strict as GFAS and I would probably just use it as a starting point to then go and do more thorough research into those sanctuaries myself. And finally, another accreditation that I really rate is PASA, the Pan-African Sanctuary Alliance. So this obviously focuses in Africa and it looks particularly at primate sanctuaries and rehabilitation sites. 
So those are the main ones that I tend to look at. I use them as starting points to make a list of sanctuaries to look into, or I use them to check sanctuaries that I'm not so sure about and want to know if another organization has an opinion or any information on. I actually, on my Instagram, have a short guide to animal sanctuary accreditations, so I will leave that linked in the description box down below and go check that out if you want to see this written down to make it a little bit more accessible for you. And finally, a sanctuary does not need to be accredited to be ethical. There are a lot of reasons a sanctuary might not be accredited, maybe it just hasn't been able to go through the application process yet, or they don't want to be associated with another organization or large body. That's fine, that does not mean they're not ethical. These accreditations are just a really, really great starting point, particularly if you don't know what you're doing and you just want an already vetted sanctuary. If that's your position, then I would highly recommend going to GFAS and having a look through the sanctuaries there. It's a really solid starting point. So for the next few points, I'm going to use some websites of really great sanctuaries that I'm going to give as examples of the kind of things that you should be seeing. Usually when it comes to talking about ethical sanctuaries, I would talk about the Vervet Monkey Foundation because it's a very special place to me in my heart. Um, it is GFAS and PASA accredited, but just to add a little bit of variety to my platform, I have picked different sanctuaries to have a look at. So we have the Lilongwe Wildlife Sanctuary in Malawi. It has a very long list of accreditations. I know people personally who have worked there and it's a very ethical sanctuary. It's accredited by GFAS, PASA, and recognized by the ICUN. And then secondly, we have the Wild Sun Rescue Sanctuary, which is located in Costa Rica. I haven't personally been, but I have through word of mouth of people working in the field heard it's an extremely ethical place. And when I had a look through their website, they were ticking all the boxes for me. It is not accredited by any of the organizations that I mentioned, as far as I could tell, but it is recognized by the ICUN. So the very first thing that I do when I look at any wildlife sanctuary is I look at the photographs. Nine times out of 10, I don't read a single word on that sanctuary website before I decide it is not the place for me. And this is because when you are working in wildlife rescue and rehabilitation, how you choose to portray animals is a huge impact on the work that you do and is a huge representation of everything that you stand for. So because of this, you can instantly tell when you look at the website of a wildlife sanctuary what kind of audience they are looking to attract. So when I look at a wildlife sanctuary, I am looking for pictures of animals in the wild, pictures of animals clearly undergoing some sort of behavioral rehabilitation process. If humans are in the image with the animals, I am looking for them to be at a safe distance, to be separated by a fence, or to be clearly carrying out essential work, such as feeding or medical work. On the other hand, a less ethical sanctuary is probably going to be trying to draw people in with human-animal interaction. This is a really common way for sanctuaries to get high paying tourists and volunteers and to actually not be putting the welfare of the animals first but instead to be looking at profit. Most people who are very passionate about wildlife rehabilitation in the long term know that posting pictures of people touching animals, um, children in close proximity to animals, animals doing funny or cutesy unnatural things, or volunteers stroking and petting animals sends a really bad message. It tells people that this wildlife isn't dangerous, this wildlife is cuddly, this wildlife is cute, this wildlife you can be close to, and it perpetuates a lot of the ideology behind the exotic pet trade and the illegal wildlife trade. And those are not things that a legitimate wildlife sanctuary will be promoting. So if you see any pictures of that nature, you know instantly to avoid. What is particularly bad is when people have a volunteer section and they have a photo with the word volunteer over it, and it's literally a selfie with an animal. That is the biggest red flag flag I can think of in terms of wildlife pages. So let me give you a quick example of the kinds of photos I think are really good to see on wildlife sanctuary websites. So this is the page obviously for the Lilongwe Wildlife Trust. As soon as you open it, the picture you see is a natural setting, natural behavior, which is great. That's what we love. You can see, again, the pictures of animals are wild, the picture with people in, either there's no animals involved or it's very clearly a medical setting. I always look in the volunteer section because this is where you really see the kind of people they're trying to attract. So again, on the volunteer programs, the banner that people choose to use for this section, I think is really important. There is an animal and people, but you can see there is a safe distance. Obviously, um, pictures of animals in enclosures isn't a natural setting, but it's reality. I don't have an issue with that. But again, they are not hands-on with the animal. They are safely separated, and this is a work job. 
I think what they portray Sanctuary Volunteer as is a really important issue. Um, if they're portraying Sanctuary Volunteer as cuddling and playing with animals, then that's not okay. Sanctuary Volunteer is probably a lot more like this when you're gonna end up doing physical work and labor. Again, research placement, no animals involved. Vet placement, obviously a medical setting. You can actually barely even see the animal. And then this is probably um, the only thing that I noticed where there's animal interaction on the website. There's a couple of points in the video where you see baby monkeys being fed with bottles. Usually when it's a volunteer, here doing it they're separated by a fence and again no issue with that and even with this this is a necessary part of wildlife rehabilitation you do sometimes have to be hands-on with primates and feeding them but what I like about this and what you'll see when you watch all of their stuff is it's never about the person yes you might see hands you might see a chest but there is always either a fence or if there is no fence the focus is always on the primate and on the process happening it's never on holding them next to their faces or cuddling into them it's you know it's about the monkey, and because it's a video, there's also context involved. The next thing that I always look at when looking at wildlife sanctuaries is what they are actually offering. There should always be an emphasis on education. And for volunteers, I think you should always be super clear about what's actually involved with working on a sanctuary, which isn't cuddling animals 24 seven. There are certain unethical activities that are often offered as part of volunteer packages or even tourist packages on sanctuaries in order to really bring an audience in. And if you see any of these things being offered, that is a huge red flag and I would say no to that sanctuary straight off the bat. So these things include riding or bathing elephants, walking any kind of big cat on a lead or selfie opportunities with big cats, any sort of wild animal performances, petting or cuddling baby animals unnecessarily, and really anything promoting unnatural behaviors. If you want a little bit more information about unethical wildlife tourism and the activities you should be looking out for, I actually am doing an Instagram series all about that and it will all be saved in a guide as well. So I will link that down below. You can learn about the activities and why you should avoid them. So just to give you an example, I really like how the Wild Sun Rescue Center advertise their volunteering. So let's just have a little look at that and what they offer. When you open their volunteer page, I've said before, the banner that you use to advertise your volunteering is super important. This one's all about the people, which I think is great because that's a huge part of volunteering, getting to know everyone, working together. Um, just quickly, pictures like this. I know I said, obviously, you don't want lots of pictures of animals being super cutesy or doing anything unnatural. Monkeys stick their tongues out all the time. I have so many pictures of monkeys sticking their tongues out. It's not an unnatural behavior. It is a little bit cutesy, but there is a line with wildlife sanctuaries where you don't want to be promoting unnatural things, but you also do want to be getting people emotionally invested in the animals so that they want to help. So I think pictures like this, when it's just a natural moment that you've caught, I don't really mind. Monkeys go bleh a lot. And then if we go down to have a look at what it is they actually advertise as part of their volunteering program. I think that this is a really great list. Firstly, again, interaction clearly in a medical setting, which is cool. I think this is a really, really great list. What I really appreciate about it is their wording here with the nursery animal handling. So like I said in the Lilongwe video, it is sometimes necessary that you handle young animals in order to feed them, care for them, and get them ready to be living with their own kind. And you know, a lot of places would really milk this and advertise it as playing with baby animals or something. But nursery animal handling, I think is a really professional way to say it. And the other thing is the emphasis that if you want to do some of these tasks, you need to be trained and you need to be competent. It's not a case of any volunteer is gonna walk in and they're gonna be doing all the cool stuff straight off the bat because unfortunately that's not how it works. It takes a lot of time and investment to get someone comfortable working with wildlife. And it is for the safety of the wildlife and the individual Though you do not let people do things if they are not competent. The other thing I really like is that this is for people who are there for a minimum of 12 weeks. When you go down and see more short-term volunteers, a lot of the tasks are actually limited. And again, I know that can feel rubbish if you can't go for longer, but it is just extremely practical. And if you're only there for two weeks, it's gonna be really difficult to get you to the stage where staff will feel comfortable leaving you alone with a wild animal, perhaps in the nursery setting. And so that job isn't listed here. And I think that's really, really sensible. So you've really got to look at what they're offering. Are they being clear about what working at a sanctuary actually entails? And are they using any like catchy gimmicky words to try and get you to think you're gonna be playing with baby animals? So you are looking for sanctuaries that are transparent about what sanctuary work actually involves, who are very careful with their labeling of any wild animal handling, and who are not promoting unethical activities as a means to get tourists or volunteers. 
So the next thing that I look at on wildlife sanctuaries is their stance on breeding and captivity. Like I said right at the beginning of this video, a wildlife sanctuary does not exist to permanently have animals in captivity or to be increasing the amount of animals in captivity. Any ethical wildlife sanctuary should have information on their website about what their goals are in this regard. So do they have a release program? Are they working on some sort of development of a sustainable area where all the animals can be released into? And are they breeding? If a sanctuary is breeding, it should only be very, very regulated endangered species. So I'm going to use both Lilongwe and Wild Sun as examples of this for two different reasons. So let's start with Lilongwe. What you see is that you're instantly getting information about why they have animals in their care, where they're coming from save and rehabilitate animals and return as many as possible back to the wild. Now, if that's all they'd said, I would say don't buy it. That's not enough information. You can't just put a line in saying, yeah, we rescue animals and then we release them and think, you don't have to provide any evidence. What I really love is that they go on to talk a lot more about their initiatives and show really in depth what's actually happening. And then you can look at all of them in more depth. That is the level of detail that we are looking for. You cannot put in a single line saying, we rescue, rehabilitate, we release, and not put any evidence. You want that. So we're gonna have a look at Wild Sun for a slightly different reason. What we see is that, again, they do have all the information about their rescue, rehabilitate, and release program. They have all of the reasons that animals come to them with with some evidence and discussion, which I think is really cool. But what I wanted to highlight is that they actually have a breeding program. So this is for the Scarlet Macaw, and it is an endangered species, actually critically endangered, gosh. But they are very transparent about it. And they aren't advertising any sort of, you know, interaction with babies or anything as part of this. They're being very matter of fact about their program. You get all the details. And they also tell you why it's happening in this area. And they tell you what birds they currently have and what stage they're at that they're getting ready for their release. And it's really cool to see in July 2019, we successfully released our first group of parent-raised individuals back. And I mean, that is something that's really cool to see. That's a successful breeding program that looks really well regulated. But yeah, I just wanted to highlight that having a breeding program is not instantly a bad thing. What is a bad thing is having a breeding program and not being incredibly transparent about what's happening in it, who it's in association with, what's actually happening to the animals. And if they're breeding, but don't have any evidence of releasing, then that's a bit off. You're not breeding you know, for the sake of having animals in captivity. That's not right. The final thing that I really tend to delve into in websites is whether or not they are showing evidence of being actively involved in community engagement and outreach. Now again, working in a wildlife sanctuary or rehabilitation site, it means that you're really looking towards a future where these animals are going to be in the wild and live in their best life, no human intervention, no issue. But you can't get to that point if you're not engaging the local community and you're not placing any focus on education or outreach. So in my personal opinion, any ethical sanctuary would will be very obvious about what it is they're doing, not just to help the animals in their care, but to also create a better future for these animals worldwide. Again, I have come across sanctuaries that have a line that says, we are passionate about engaging the local community. We believe education is the key to conservation, but then there's nothing. There's no evidence of initiatives, there's no photographs of anything going on, there's literally no expansion. And just saying that and saying, yeah, we go teach once a week at this place or something, it, it doesn't really mean anything. What you want is some solid evidence of really great programs happening. So let's take a look at Lilongwe first, because honestly, I think they are excelling here. Start off by recognizing how important wildlife conservation actually is to the local community. Our environmental education program seeks to build the next generation of conservationists. To date, it has supported tens of thousands of children in hundreds of schools across the central and northern regions of Malawi. I love particularly when organizations are focusing on bringing up young people or women and girls and engaging them in conservation because that is the future of conservation. And so much, like there's so much information about community engagement here and I just think that is so key. So let's have a quick look at Wild Sun as well. So again, we believe education is a fundamental part of conservation, absolutely. Then they go on to talk about they actually 
actually have conservation education internships and that's really cool again because you want to be getting people involved in conservation with all different kinds of backgrounds if you're not interested in working hands-on with wildlife that doesn't mean you can't be involved in long-term solutions to conservation and so that's a really cool initiative there program provides children with the means to conduct a research project to identify the most important plants for native animals that's so cool. <laughs> Again, it's bringing up a future generation of conservationists and focusing on doing that from within the local area. Not quite as comprehensive as the long way, but I think that it looks like they're doing really great work. And I also really quickly just want to note that not all wildlife sanctuaries are as affluent as others and some can't actually afford to be doing the level of community engagement and investment that Lilongwe are doing. So while they are amazing, yes, it's not that I'm looking for every sanctuary to be at that level. I'm just looking for every sanctuary to be actively engaging. The difficulty is places can hide things and you're never gonna know 100% for sure from a website that a place is run ethically. That's why I love doing things through word of mouth and I love talking to people in the industry but if you don't have anyone then the best you can do is go through this process, be as careful as possible and if you get somewhere and you don't agree with it, don't beat yourself up about it. You tried and all you can do really is be that word of mouth for someone else to warn them off it. I have so many stories of people who have looked into sanctuaries and found absolutely nothing indicating that there's anything unethical happening and then they've told me they got there and something was happening that made them super uncomfortable and there's just no way they could have known. I've had people actually tell me about things happening at sanctuaries and I have dug through the internet trying to find any evidence of it and I can't. And the final thing I want to say that I forgot to say right at the start stupidly is you should not just look at their websites, look at their Facebook pages, their Instagrams, their YouTubes, whatever it is, any social media that they have, look at it all. Because they might have a beautiful website with no animal interaction, then you open their Instagram and every second picture is a selfie with an animal, you know? You've got to look at everything and that way you're going to get a really all-rounded view of the sanctuary and how they present themselves across all different kinds of platforms. Anyway, I have definitely rambled on for long enough on this topic. If there are any points you would like expanding on more, please do let me know. And I hope this video highlighted what a good sanctuary will be presenting themselves as and things to look out for for unethical sanctuaries. Please always feel free to DM me on Instagram if you have any questions. I will get back to you as soon as I possibly can and I am always happy to talk about wildlife and ethical wildlife tourism, volunteering and wildlife rehab. That is my jam. So thanks so much for watching and I will see you in the next one.